Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of You Can't Come Over But You Can Come In. Today's guest is Leslie Fram, who is the Senior Vice President of Music Strategy at CMT. And Leslie's the first um, guest we've had that's not a singer-songwriter, but I think you should know, Leslie, that you have been asked for. Really? Almost from the start. So you're, you're an executive that's kind of a, a little bit of a celebrity. No, 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 no. Well, first of all, I'm honored because I've been watching all of them and you're killing it. I loved, um, the last one I watched was you and Reba, which was epic. <laughs> that was pretty, I mean, that was really bucket list for me. When I saw that Reba was going to, was willing to do it, it just, it blew my mind. And, you know, her only request was that she not sing. So it made it so I got to sing some of her um, classic hits, which was pretty amazing. I remember um, one time seeing her at City Winery. Mm -hmm. And she was with her team, and when it was over, we ran into her in the parking lot, and she was in her SUV, and she was driving the team. And I was like, this is so incredible. Like, Reba's driving herself. You know, it's really, there haven't, most everybody that's done this has been like you, Johnny on the spot, with coming in on the Zoom, and you were even early. I sent yours a little bit early, but, you know, Reba... And I knew it would be this way, sent it to her, boom, there she was on my screen. And there's a reason why, she, I always say there's a reason why she's a one-namer. Like, one-namers are not lazy. <laughs> she's incredible. The work ethic is out of control. And that's why she's so successful, obviously. And to this day, she's like the hardest working woman, right? Yes. Yeah, she's, she, she's an inspiration to, I think, all women. And, you know, men too, probably, just with what, what she has done and, and just set her sights on what she wanted and got it. It's funny, we did this, uh, one of our Artists of the Year specials, we were honoring Reba, and in the montage of songs, we had Sam Hunt do Fancy, because you know he does it, when he does his montages, he'll do it in concert, and she was like, this is the first male I've ever heard do Fancy, and of course he nailed it, but she loved it, loved it. So she's an inspiration to men and women, obviously. Completely. So I have a question, I, and since you've seen this, you've, um, you know that I like to start with what song made you want to write songs. But for you, yeah. since you started your career in radio, what was it that, as a child that made you, or did you think about that as a child, I guess would be the, the first question. About a song or about why I got into radio? You mean like a song song? Or like radio, like did you think when you would hear the radio DJs, would you think, oh, I want to do that? I was like an extremely shy kid. And so part of my uh, entertainment was listening to the radio and trying to find these radio stations, you know, like in Chicago and Little Rock that I could find. And it, that was my form of entertainment, honestly, because I was super shy. So I started calling DJs and requesting songs and thought, this is like the most fascinating thing. And that's when the love for radio and wanting to get into radio and, you know, just being a music fan and having a you know older brother and sister turn me on to stuff like i i remember one summer going from listening to like jim croce to black sabbath so i was all over the place <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing did you listen to any country music at, during that time it's crazy country was just not in my sphere because my brother was listening to rock and classic rock and so most of it was like you know the beatles and led zeppelin and a lot of uh, late 70s rock. And I became a huge fan of, I think I've told you this, Jackson Brown, like one of my all time favorite writers. So it really wasn't in my sphere. And then when I got into radio, I was like top 40 and then rock and alternative. I was, uh, the, the most thing that I knew about country was like classic country, big right. fan of Johnny Cash. Got to see Johnny Cash at the Roxy in Atlanta and we got to interview him on our rock station and then I became a little bit more familiar with country when I moved to New York in 2008. A couple of label guys took me to see, like, I remember going to see Brad Paisley and going, freaking out over his animation. And yeah. Dirk Bentley had opened. And then I went to see Keith Urban. It was like a rock show. Mm -hmm. And then I went to see Miranda Lambert, which coincidentally was CMT on tour, which I didn't know. And saw her at a venue in New York and Eric Church was opening for her. Okay. So I started like seeing all these artists and kind of falling in love with, you know, contemporary country. I love that. I love, I love the It's crazy. 
Yes. So I'm kind of jumping all over the map. Oh, that's fine. That, you know, a lot of people that tune into this get frustrated. They want to know, why don't I hear my favorite artist on the radio? You've been a program director. Could you explain a little bit about how radio stations are programmed? I was really lucky, you know, initially to be at uh, a station called 99X most of my career, which was an alternative station. But we had this campaign called No Labels, which meant we're just gonna play great music. So for me, we had that freedom. We could play Sarah McLachlan and the Gin Blossoms and then play like anything that was coming out of Seattle, like Nirvana and Soundgarden and Pearl Jam. So we had that freedom. We could break artists in our own market because we felt that the fans don't know if an artist is signed or unsigned, right? They just know great songs. So we would break artists in our community like Sean Mullins and people that were in Atlanta that were making the scene. So I was lucky to be in radio at that time. But as you know, for radio formats there, it's about playing the most popular songs over and over again for ratings. So that's mm -hmm. why you might hear a song every two and a half hours. It's because it's like, let's play the biggest hits for ratings. And radio became, and I don't want to get too in the weeds because it's, it's really hard to understand, but deregulation happened and a lot of stations around the country, it was taken out of the hands of the local program directors. So you can't really blame the local program directors because now they're overseeing multiple stations and you know they don't really have the freedom to program to their market, which is what I miss about radio. Because if I was programming a station in a certain market, I'd want to support those artists from that market. So it is a little frustrating. And when I came over to country, as you know, and I've said this publicly in, in, in writing, you were one of the inspirations for Next Women of Country because I got here and I didn't realize that women weren't supported on terrestrial radio, which was so frustrating because, you know, in the 90s, even though it was only 30%, you were hearing all women and women were huge, right? From Shania to Faith Hill. Um, I was really heartbroken that women weren't getting their fair shake. So we started Next Women of Country at CMT that we could play their videos and their content. And then I found out if you don't have a song on the radio, you can't get on a tour. Mm -hmm. So we started a tour and you were actually on the tour that we did with Jennifer Nettles. And some of those artists that we've had on tour never, had never been on a tour before. It was their first tour. So it's, um, it's this crazy cycle, as you know, and you were one of the inspirations because you had this amazing music. And I was like, people need to hear Brandy Clark. They need to hear her music. And you made this video for us for Stripes that we ended up playing for seven months. To me, I was like, if I were programming a radio station, this song's a smash. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you and John Marks. John Marks at Sirius Place yeah. as well. But yeah, I remember that. That was my first meet. It, first time I met you was with my good friend Ted Crockett. Yes. Um, you had seen me at the Bluebird. I want to say it was Shane McAnally and Josh Osborne, maybe. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, that was really a, a game changer for me. And I find you to be, you're one of those people I would say, Leslie puts her money where <laughs> And there are still people like that in radio. You know, I've met some I think so. along the way. But what you just mentioned, I think, is why a lot of people on here get frustrated is a lot of times it's not the local. It's definitely not the DJ, usually, that's that's programming the station. A lot of times one person's programming dozens of stations. So the playlist is the playlist. And but it's tough. It's really tough right now because, you know, with consolidation and the, just the economy of it all, a lot of, um, you have a lot of syndicated radio shows, a lot of voice tracking where the DJ isn't live. And so the radio that to work in, even in New York, is kind of slowly disappearing. Mm -hmm. And that to me is um, Sirius XM is that you had that filter and that DJ who could turn you on to music and we just don't have that anymore, which is so sad because radio was my first love. Uh, yes, there are still stations out there, like a lot of the non-com stations and stations like WRLT in Nashville that do support the local community. And again, I can't blame the program directors or the DJs, but that's what the radio that I fell in love with. Totally. Um, so in that oh i was going to ask you i want to make sure i get to my questions and not of get of course 
So in your time, especially at, you know, 99X, where you guys were kind of celebrities, and now you've got, what's the, you guys are doing a podcast now, I've listened to it. What's that? We started this podcast um, with the old morning show that I was on, The Morning X. During COVID, just Sundays, we would just get together for an hour on Sunday morning, and we just added a new person. One of, one of our guys dropped out, but we just wanted a vehicle to just talk about what's going on in the world mm-hmm. and kind of more lighthearted entertainment because I think people are looking for that. You know, I think it's, it's, a, it's heavy what's happening in the world right now. So we started, we just get together on Sundays and do that. It's called the, the Pop Culture Show. So anytime you want to be on. I'd love to be on. And you guys that are tuning in, check out the Pop Culture Show. Thank you. I- a couple of them the one where one of the guys got covid that was very interesting i mean it was terrible i'm glad he survived yeah really? i think it's the reality of people if unless you know somebody that has it some people don't think it exists mm-hmm. and as you know it's like the people aren't wearing masks and there's been an uproar about it it's to me it's not a political thing it's a safety thing about wearing a mask and so yep. we just try to we try to you know talk about real life subjects i love that I know people that have gotten it that have been very safe. So it's very real. Um, so next question, well, m- mostly at 99X, but anytime, do you remember a couple of records that you thought this is going to be huge? Like when you first heard it and were so excited to get it out there um, on your morning show? Well, a couple of, uh, you know how an artist go and visit radio stations. We had the same thing. Not as much as what happens with country, but um, I remember an artist coming in and playing in our conference room. And I always hated making artists play in the conference room, but we didn't have a vibey room at the time. Um, this new female artist, Alanis Morissette. Oh. And she came in and she played some songs and, and then we heard some of the recorded songs. And we were all like, okay, this is, these songs are tremendous. Little did we know it was gonna go on to sell, you know, gaz- gazillions of copies. I think she was one of them. Um, We had some of those types of moments. And then there was an artist that that came in, a local artist. And I don't know if you ever remember Sean Mullins. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Sean Mullins came in and we heard heard this one song called Lullaby. And those were sort of the days where you could just run into the control room and put it on the air right then. And we did. And about an hour later, you know, he had multiple phone calls of labels wanting to sign him and he ended up getting signed off that song which spearheaded his whole career but those are the things that i miss because again like you can really help an artist turn their life around and open and open doors people i there was, many of those moments in the 90s people can't like what they don't hear exactly they don't hear it they just can't like it, which is why it's so great you're doing what you're doing, not only with Next Woman of Country, but change the conversation. And the things are, the tide is turning at country radio. I noticed that I see way more females in the top 30 than I used to. And I think you guys have a lot to do with that. We uh, started um, several months ago, CMT Equal Play, which I know you know about. We kind of looked internally and said, what more can we do? So we took all of our video channels, you know, in the morning, CMT plays videos in the morning until 9 a.m. And then we have a 24 hour channel called CMT Music. So it's equal play, 50-50 men and women. It's not hard to do, by the way. And our hope was that not asking people at radio to go 50-50 or, you know, internet radio, but can you move the needle a little bit? And it's not hard to do, Brandy, as you know, there's so many great female videos from the last five years, the last 10 years. And it's just about playing more females. So it, again, it's not hard to do. And so that's our hope. And we're gonna announce some more things coming up with Equal Play that I think will continue to move the needle. That's amazing. That's so, that's just great. And I, and I believe it is about exposure. And because, I mean, it, I always compare everything to ice cream. Um, you know, they'll say, people yeah. will say, well, women don't test well. and if all somebody ever gets is vanilla ice cream, when you throw chocolate in there, it's a little weird. So, you know, but if you give, if you give people that chance, I think half the people will choose uh, chocolate ice cream. And I think, you know, and again, I want to preface this by saying I was a radio programmer, never in country, but rock and top 40. It's just good programming, diversity and balance for any radio station in any genre 
is just great programming and the ratings go up when you see that because you don't want to hear the same thing over and over again. And the female artists not only bring in a, you know, a different perspective, but variety, which is so missing from country radio right now. Oh yeah. We all like, it's, we all like a little variety. <laughs> variety. So when I like to, I go to everybody's Wikipedia, even if I know them before this and I went to yours and it said that uh -oh. you're a narrator on the Cartoon Net Network series, Toon Heads. Is that correct? It's really funny. I was doing a lot of voice work at the time when I had time and I got to do Toon Heads. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen Toon Heads, but every once in a while people will go, hey, was that you on Toon Heads? Because it was in Atlanta, you know, the, the Cartoon Network. And so, yeah, that was fun. So you think Random, it's right? It's kind of random. Well, do you think you'll do any more of that? I would love to. I would love to. I think, listen, I think people need to, like what you're doing, people need to explore all their passions if you've got the time to do it, because it's like we only have one life, right? So I love what you've been doing during COVID. And I find it really interesting because I've been able to, you know, hear more of the stories by, you know, some of the artists that you're talking to. You know, you and I love Charlie Worsham. Oh, yes. And it's like every time I hear an interview with Charlie, I learn something new. So it's, it's good. It's good. And during this time, I think a lot of people are sort of finding new passions. Well, you know what's funny? Thank you for saying that. It's This started out just as a way, because my album came out right before this started. And so how could I do something weekly that didn't get boring? And right. it started out very much trading songs with the guests. And it, it sort of morphed into me more interviewing. And it reminded me my first, I mean, I had several majors in college, but my first major was journalism and I wanted to be Barbara Walters. And so maybe this, this COVID time is allowing me that because I do love this and I, and I love more of the, the conversation than I even do. I mean, I love the music clearly, but I, I love to get to know things about people I didn't know and it's fun. I didn't know that that was your, about the journalism part for you because that was it for me as well. And to me, um, if I'm going to interview somebody, I do a little prep, but I don't, I really want to just have a conversation and let it flow. Mm -hmm. You have to go in and you have to be a really good listener. And, and that's what I'm finding when I'm watching what you've been doing. You're just a really good listener. And oh. then you, have, you bring out stories from people. And I always think it's so great artist to artist, by the way. Oh, I do too. And you know, that's usually, thanks for noticing all that. That's yeah. You know, um, my friend and co-writer Shane McAnally, who I've worked so much with, he always says, Randy's the best listener I've ever met, which always makes me feel really good. But I do think, you it's know, true. stories, you have to listen. Like, and I'm not always the greatest listener in a writing room because I get excited, but, but you have to, I love a great story and I love to retell it. So you got to at least listen to it the first time, you know, and then you can embellish it. But, but I like, I like to listen and I feel like I'm on output so much with performing or writing that it's nice to just take it in. So I don't know, maybe this is my, maybe this will be a new part of my career when this it is should be. And honestly, the other thing that you have, um, which I don't have for this format, I might in other formats, but the historical perspective makes, especially when it's artist to artist, I remember when I lived in New York, I was really fortunate. I would go to some tapings of this show called Spectacle that Elvis Costello did at the Apollo. And it was Elvis interviewing other artists. And then they would perform together. But I would hear like one time he interviewed James Taylor and James Taylor was telling him stuff I had never heard about from James Taylor. And I really think it was that artist to artist thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that you have that. So yeah, don't get, I think this should be part of what you do in the future. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll keep it up. So I've kept you a, a while, but I won't, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'll let you go. So what is the biggest change you've seen in radio? It doesn't have to just even be radio. It can just be in music um, or the way we consume music. And then what's, what hasn't changed? What's stayed the same? Well, I think authenticity has stayed the same because I do think that fans continue to react to authenticity. I mean, you can tell that when you see certain songs that they might go to number one, but there's really no engagement, right, with the fans, whether it's streaming or selling or whatever. So I think that still exists. That's what I love about this format. I fell in love with the songwriters first when I moved here, 
when I saw you and, and Shane at the Bluebird. So I think first and foremost, that's what I love about this format and the and country music, the stories. But I think it's exciting. The biggest change is just how people are consuming because the fact that you can do something on YouTube and Facebook Live and Instagram and get to fans wherever they are is extraordinary if you think about it. Oh. And I think it's never been a better time to be an artist. I agree with that. When I moved to Nashville, if you weren't on a major label, you didn't have a prayer. Like, no chance at all. And now, I think sometimes you stand a better chance. I mean, I know for me, like, you, like when you took a chance on me, I didn't have a label. I think, you know what, I got an independent label, like, the night yeah, before. I do, yes. But before it all happened, because he wanted to wait. And I was like, no, 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 no. I've already paid for this video. We have to do this. But, but when we made the video and when you approached me, I didn't have any of that. And I've seen even since, even in my path, that more and more, I, I feel like sometimes artists are in, at an advantage to not have a deal until something starts to happen because then they have a little more creative control. And that's so, I don't know an artist that that's not important to. It is, and I think that it's not about taking a risk. It's just, you have all these different avenues. And if you're creative, I mean, look, people are discovering people on TikTok every day. So I think it's a great time. And, and I think a lot of artists shouldn't be so precious with the music, but just put it out there. Don't be afraid and, and find your audience. So TikTok, do you, do you get on TikTok? It's funny, you know, like I saw, I get on there and I'll go through and go down a deep, dark uh, hole with dog videos. <laughs> you know people with their dogs but i did see uh there was a really funny one i saw the other day with carrie underwood her workout one which was fascinating but yes i have got gotten on there and it's quite entertaining you know for me it says so much about what you watch two yes. things come up on my puppies and pimple popping like, exactly the rabbit holes that i go down on TikTok. um i got it because my godson told me he was blowing up on there and i needed to <laughs> But um, it's, it is the most addictive, most addictive. I thought I was addicted to Twitter. This is more addictive. Oh. Um, and one thing I did want to ask you before we leave is um, my dream is that you and I, since we have a passion for Breaking Bad, one mm -hmm. of the greatest series of all times and series finale, is that you and I get to interview Jesse Pinkman. I would love that. Would that not be amazing? Aaron Paul, we're looking for you. <laughs> love that. And you know, I was just turning, the other day I had Maddie and Tay on here and we were talking before or after, I can't remember which, it wasn't on the conversation, but about Breaking Bad and Tay had not seen it. And Maddie oh. and I said, oh, you need to stop when we, as soon as we get done, you need you to- have to, it's, yeah. it's one of the greatest series ever. Yeah, yes, and I, I, I'll, I'll offer you this, Leslie, I will take you on a Breaking Bad tour because I got one for my birthday a couple of years ago and I liked it, but I just felt like it wasn't enough. And so I researched and took a couple of writers. I was doing a writing retreat in Santa Fe and took um, Scott Stepakoff and Jason Gant on my own version of the Breaking Bad tour. Oh, it's, it's great. And you I know, love that. the people that own the Walton Schuyler's house, I don't know why they get upset when people stop and take pictures, but they do. So anyways, it's a lot of fun. I would love, I'm, I'm going to keep that uh, in the back of my head. We have to do that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leslie, for being on here. Thanks for everything you do. Fighting such oh, a, thank you. not just for women, but just for artists um, in general. We all appreciate you. And not just me. I'm telling you this, this group of people that watches this, this show every week has asked for you a couple times. So I'm honored. Seriously. Thank you so much. And uh, again, love the new record. Thank you. Thank you. It's brilliant. Thanks so much. It's your masterpiece. Right. There'll be more to come. Getting ready to have yeah. a video for that. So. Okay, good. Thank you for having me on, seriously. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So today's episode had a, um, a twist. Um, I've been waiting on my guest, who shall remain nameless, um, but, but maybe we'll book him for another time. I think he might be hungover somewhere, which is understandable the way the world is today people maybe need to drink a little more than than usual so my manager gail gilman has uh, agreed to step in and many of you have asked for gail to be a guest and understandable. Um, the understandable 
Mm-hmm. And so what we're going to do is Gail's going to ask me five questions um, that she's always wanted to ask me, but hasn't. And um, maybe I'll ask her a few as well. Those of you that don't know Gail, she manages me. She manages Jennifer Nettles, Sugarland. Um, before that, she managed Vonda Shepherd. started her career managing Joan Baez. Before that, she worked at the historic Greek theater. Um, I don't know why, I just did a quote. Um, but anyways, maybe Gail would want to, to tell a little bit of her history. Do you, want to, do you want to do that or do you want to just get to the I was, It was fun listening. Oh, okay. It made me feel a little bit more important than I feel on a daily basis. Um, I actually started my career as a, as a ice cream scooper, at 31 <laughs> flavors, and I still go there quite often. And after that, I was actually an usher at the Greek theater when I was 16 years old and just vowed that I was going to go and start a career in the music business. And I re- literally just sat in really in the lobby of the executive offices until somebody gave me a job and worked for free for a long time and worked my way in, saw hundreds and thousands of shows. I couldn't even count, but had the fortune of seeing and working with Linda Ronstadt and John Prine and Cher and Barry Manilow. I mean, working with meaning they came into the theater and, you know, we would work their shows, but it was a wonderful um, way to start doing what I do and the fortunate, the fortunate. Is- so question, of all those shows, would you have a top three? To oh, at the Greek theater? Randy. James Taylor, Joni Mitchell. Mm-hmm. I don't know, that, that's, that's really tough. Those two were easy. So there must be a lot of people vying for that third spot. I'm going to say Barry Manilow. Mm, love that. Love that. And those artists like Manilow, well, then there's Bette Midler. Mm. There's four. Maybe one more. I should have said top five instead of top three. You get five. And then all the great bands like the OJs and, and the Temptations and Dion Warwick, Johnny Mathis. I mean, the list goes on. I, I don't think I can do that. I mean, I, I did do it, but I can't really say. There were just too many. Wonderful, amazing, magical nights at that theater. I still love it. I grew up right down the street from it. Mm-hmm. It's probably why you love live music so much. I mean, oh, for sure. You know, you come on the road with me, you're on the road with Jennifer, Sugarland. I know you used to be on the road with Vonda and Joan. Um, yeah. And that's not that, for those of you all that are tuned in, most managers really don't go on the road. I mean, they come out on the road some, but Gail is actually on the road more than she's not, um, which I, I, love I appreciate. Yeah. Um, Cause it's about the live experience. That's what makes this year so, so strange is we're not having that live experience. And so we're figuring out other ways to do that. This being one of them, but. Um, well, I call all of you and make you sing for me. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's true. Oh, very true. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to turn the table for a second. Okay. And we were, I was talking to a dear friend of ours about this because she she, uh, works with us on a peripheral basis. And she said to me, you know, Gail, because I don't want to take credit for this question. She said, if I were asking Brandy a question, I would say, if your life were a record, what would that record be? Mm. Meaning of another artist. Boy, that's a great question. Um, you know, there's so many records that mean so much to me. I mean, I have a couple, kind of like how you have a couple of the those um, top performances at the Greek. Uh, a record that changed my life was Patsy Cline's Greatest Hits. Um, I saw the movie Sweet Dreams, and when I was, so my, for my ninth birthday, I remember my mom got me my dad got me a softball mitt and my mom got me that, that album on cassette. And I remember Patsy was wearing, I think she was wearing a, a yellow dress and there was a green background or it might've been green dress, yellow background. I can't remember, but that record, and I always thought that was really symbolic because I was really into sports 
and I was and I was really into music and so those two gifts um, for my ninth birthday kind of summed me up and so that album is is the reason why I ever wanted to write songs why I ever wanted to sing songs um, and then you know years later uh, the Patti Loveless album when Fallen Angels Fly I would say that was the album that pushed me to move to Nashville um, there was not a song on that album I didn't love and not only did it did it was it about um, Patty on that album. It was also about some of the songwriters. Gretchen Peters had a couple of songs on there who became a big influence of mine as a writer. Um, Jim Lauderdale, Marcus Humman. Um, I started to really notice album credits on that album in particular. So, you know, those two albums probably. I hope that's a good answer. I mean, there's many more, but but those those two albums changed my life. I think there are always records like that. There are artists like that, that sort of start that ball rolling or your wheels turning. So for you, that, that makes sense. Of course, it's the right answer, you know? Okay, here's my second question to you. What is a question, just one question, if you can think of this, that you've never been asked that you would like to have been asked? Hmm. Any topic. Boy, that's a really good, that's a really good question as well. Your manager. You know, oh man, any topic, never been asked. I think probably why does country music resonate with me the way it does? Um, because I didn't come from the South. Um, and a lot of people think of country music as Southern music. I don't think of it that way, probably because I'm not from the South, but I would answer it, you know, to me, it's adult music and it's truth telling music. And even as a little kid, listening to my grandparents' country music, which was Merle Haggard and Loretta Lynn and George Jones. Um, I remember Merle Haggard had a song called Let's Chase Each Other Around the Room Tonight. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew it was something adult. And then- You know that now? Now, yes. And then, yeah. and then there was a Mel McDaniel song written by Bob McDale called Baby's Got Her Blue Jeans On. And my brother and I thought it was literally a baby that, that had blue jeans on it. I remember my mom explaining to us- theme here. What's that? I'm trying to see a theme here. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't all just like sexual tone things, but I remember my mom saying, no, he's talking about a woman. And we were like, oh, we thought it was a baby, you know? Um, but there was something in country music beyond all that that was adult that always felt very real to me and always felt it, it transcended what part of the country you were from or whether you were black or white or gay or straight or any of those things um, that can divide us it, it, at the heart of it. I think it's why I love Patsy Cline so much and Willie Nelson and Loretta and Merle. It, it, it really joined us in an ache and a heartache. I'm gonna get teary talking about it. Um, and even before I knew what that was, I liked the way it felt. Maybe that makes me sick, but I liked the way that a sad song felt. Um, I liked songs about love gone wrong. Um, you know, I remember one of the first songs I remember as a kid, and it's so um, relevant today, was an Anne Murray song called A Little Good News Today. And I didn't know about the problems in the world, but that song, I knew there was, you know, that there was a lot more going on than what was in my living room in Morton, Washington. So anyways, there's my answer. Didn't mean to get all So this. just listening to you answer that question, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure your guitar is within reach. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put you on the spot and you might not be able to do this because I don't know the last time you played it. Can you play I Only Miss You When I'm Drinking? Oh, you know, let me see here. See if I can. If I can. Now that I've got a second choice. No, I can figure it out. I can fake my way through it. 
at least part of it. Please. I only miss you when I'm drinking. Otherwise, I'm doing fine. Your memory don't creep in. If I keep a sober mind, ain't it all like what you think? The honest truth is, I'm okay. Only miss you when I'm drinking. I'm only drinking every day. So called friends will say I'm lying. I'm still floating in a funnel. That they only see me. They only see me when I'm lost. So no matter what they tell you, can't believe a word they say. Only miss you when I'm drinking. Only drinking every. hits my lips my head stopped I lost it there but you get the gist I, I, I remember the first time um, you played that for me I was in a taxi um, I think we were in a taxi Yeah. Um, coming from the airport in Las Vegas I don't know if we were there I mean who knows um, but I just remember just sobbing when you were talking about sounds and you know songs that made you feel a certain way. I'll never forget that feeling. And I think as a manager who's a fan, th those are the things that we all feel when we hear your music. And, and it's, you know, I think I said to you, somebody had asked me like, why, why are you a manager? What is it that drives you with an artist? And I said, if you're not gonna either, if you wouldn't buy a ticket to that artist or, concert or buy their record you probably shouldn't manage them because there's something about being invested in in the artistry of your client that really um i think helps all of us do our jobs so um in that same vein i know i only have i have uh three to ask you but i want you to sing one other thing because i've missed uh, i think your fans have missed hearing you sing on your you can come mm -hmm. over saying it from my own perspective okay. the song that you played it was on an instagram that you wrote with jesse joe and shane and i just want to call it the train song oh waiting on a train can you can you, can you allow on? yes let me let me see your your life oh, i'm just making the ones that are the, the most difficult for you <laughs> well you know Okay, I just gotta find the key. That's always my issue, is finding the key. Okay. All your when I've been giving in, held on too long, might have been, maybe. You say you do until you don't. I swear you will, but I know you won't, and it makes me crazy. Like I'm standing in. And all I see are planes Try to make you love me Well, it's the same damn thing Standing in an airport Waiting on the train I mean... I, I, I wish I had a memory, like, I wish I could, rem I, 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 unless I'm playing, this is something, a fun fact, unless I'm playing something every night, mm -hmm. it's hard for me to retain it. Well, so just, 
threw two things at you, you know? Two what? I just threw two things at you. Well, you know what I, why I think that is? And, and, I, and I have to say this because I'm sure people, people um, listening are thinking, well, she wrote the thing. Why wouldn't she remember it? The truth is I'm in the mode of creating new songs every day. Like right. you mentioned Shane and Jesse Joe this morning, Shane and I wrote a new song. We're halfway through it. And so my mind, if I, if I have too much of that in my mind, I'll repeat what I've done. Yeah. So I kind of write them and let go of them. And then when I record them, relearn them. No. Now you didn't ask that, but that's just a fun fact. Fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. Okay. I have, I have one more question for you. I have, on each record also, not counting your live record, but 12 Stories, Big Day, and Your Life is a Record. Can you choose one song from each record that you would want another artist, artist to record and who that artist would be? Okay. Hold my hand. Mm -hmm. Leanne Womack. Um, big Day. Big Day in a Small Town. Big Shelton. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be the sad song, Trisha Yearwood. Oh, so we need to, we have some work to do. Yeah, those would be my dream. Like when I think of those songs and I think of what other voice would I love to hear sing them, that, mm. those would be them. That, those are interesting choices. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can get that done for you. Okay. okay so I'm going to, I'm going to, in this on a fun and what I think is a fun question. Okay. So I know you the first tour, big tour you went on was with Jennifer Nettles. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Where we met. Yes. So what is your most surprising or adventure that happened or you on that tour that you never even in your wildest dreams you think, God, when I go on the road, this could happen or that could happen. And what's your best moment and worst moment on the tour bus? Okay, I love these questions. Um, so, you know, when I went out with Jennifer, I had, I mean, I had done some, I had, of course, grown up playing shows and I had done some shows, but I'd never been on a tour. And, um, and man, it was a great one because I know I, we both love Jennifer, but you know, that first, your, your road experience shapes how you feel about the road. And that first one was so great for me that it made me want to be, it made me fall in love with the road in a way I didn't think I would. Mm. And had it been bad, I might have felt differently, you know, and, uh, and it was a pretty long tour. Um, so, you know, I think... The best experience of that tour for me was having to come out and sing with Jennifer every night. I didn't want to do it because I was really intimidated to do it. Uh -huh. It really made me grow and mm -hmm. it made me stand toe to toe with someone who's one of the best entertainers I've ever and singers I've ever had the, the honor of sharing a stage with and a very different entertainer than the kind I am. And so it was a great lesson to me okay, just because, you know, I mean, Jennifer to me has never lost that little girl with the hairbrush in the mirror. She's never gotten self-conscious. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, it's why she's so great on stage. And it also, but it made me see, see that, okay, I can come out and duet with somebody like that, even though I'm not that and, and hold my own, you know, and I got better as it went on. Um, so that was the best thing that came out of that. Um, best time on the tour bus and worst time? Mm -hmm. um, man, I mean, just, you know, those times were pretty great. And then um, probably the worst time on the tour bus um, or on the road was when I was out at Eric Church, there was a little bit of a misunderstanding and <laughs> I was getting kicked off the tour. It wasn't because of me. It was a misunderstanding about someone uh -huh. and what they, what they had thought he had done. And it all got cleaned up, but there was a, there were a few hours that were like, holy shit, you know, I'm going to get kicked off of this tour. Everything got straightened out. 
That was probably, that was, that was not a great, that was not a great moment. Um, but you know, I've been really lucky. I've had good people on the road with me. Um, I've had, I've been on great tours. You know, I've been out with Jennifer, Alan Jackson, um, Eric Dwight. Um, I was just out with Tanya Tucker. That was some of my funnest, honestly, honestly, with Tanya, because she's so fun. And um, th those were, that was really good. That, if I had to end on something before this long break, I, that was, a, I didn't know it was going to be the end for a while, but that was a good, that was fun. So something just came to mind also when you were talking, and, and we talked about this off offline, and I know a couple of your fans love this song as well. I'm not going to ask you to play it, mm -hmm. but I think in light of the world, it would be really cool for all of us to hear you sing Salvation Works at some point, maybe the next oh. time you do something. I'm going to get Lori McKenna on here, and, and I wrote that with Lori and Jennifer. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that would be the one for me to play it on. Or one of these cover times, but I'll do that. This will be timely, but when, when it comes out, it might not be, but a very fun fan of yours just turned 50, and I know that's one of her favorite songs, and I think we all need a little bit of lifting in our life right now, and you certainly give that to all of us through your music, and I can say that being your manager, I feel it, and I watch those streams and listen, and I get the fortune of listening to you sing a lot, so... Thanks for that. Thanks for having me on. I, you know. Thanks I, for coming on. I mean, you. Do I get paid for this? Well, you can have 15% of what I get for it. <laughs> um, Anytime I'll come back and just send me some questions. I'm here to, to serve. All right. So thank you, Gail, for especially coming in at a pinch. I mean, now that other guest, I don't know if we'll find him or not. He's somewhere down in Texas. I'm sure having a good time. Anyways, um, we'll see you guys next week and um, take care out there. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Gail. <laughs>